Not very often I'm impressed by a Call of Duty campaign. Most of the times, in fact, I kind of find there's more to laugh about the campaigns than to actually praise. Though with Infinity Ward's take on the return to roots or boots on the boots ground on the trend the franchise was going in, they decided to pull out the big guns and go where all the Call of Duty hype really started to take off, and that was with Call of Duty Modern Warfare. 50,000 people used to live here. Now it's a ghost town. And what a better way to capture those original COD 4 feels than kind of start right back there with a new version of Modern Warfare. But the interesting thing about this is that this was Infinity Ward's first development of three years they had for a full game, which is showcased very well within the campaign. Along with revisiting the series of the Call of Duty franchise that brought the masses to Call of Duty, the hype couldn't be any higher. Though I still held my hype in reserve for Modern Warfare as Games like Infinite Warfare, Ghost, and even Modern Warfare 3 really showed to me that Infinity Ward struggled to capture the magic that COD 4 and Modern Warfare 2 really had. That sure is a hot take! I'm sure losing a good portion of the studio over a lawsuit didn't quite help out much with that either. Not even the fish could save Call of Duty Ghost. With more development time, a return to their roots, and the Modern Warfare name, Infinity Ward really set themselves up to capture the magic the original team once had. Well, did they do it? You're goddamn right. But Kevin, why talk about Modern Warfare 2019 when Modern Warfare 2 releases this week? Well, I think it's important to have a fresh take on what happened previously as Modern Warfare 2 is a continuation of Modern Warfare 2019's campaign. So it's important to understand what Modern Warfare 2019 did right so then hopefully Modern Warfare 2 can keep on with that excitement. So in this video, I plan to talk about Modern Warfare 2019's campaign and showcase the level of detail they went into with this game. How this game was technically one of the most advanced Call of Duties we've ever played, and also some of the interesting historical references they used to create some of the missions and how they succeeded and repurposed some of those stories. Stellar characters new and old, and how Modern Warfare 2019 might be the greatest Call of Duty campaign of all time. If you guys enjoy these types of analytical videos about video games, make sure to tap that like button. Let me know you want to see some more content like this. Leave a comment down below what game would you like to see me to cover next. But let's not waste any more time and get right into those details. Ah, ah, he said it, he said it. Before diving into the game though, we have to set the scene of what Infinity Ward was walking into when creating the next Call of Duty game. After releasing the most disliked game trailer on YouTube ever and ultimately unfavorable reviews, Infinite Warfare was generally the nail in the coffin when it came to advanced movement Call of Duties. Activision then changed the direction to go the boots on the ground style with World War II, which was kind of meh with a very forgettable campaign. Black Ops 4 Strip just ditching the campaign altogether for a battle royale, the community was craving for a good campaign experience. The game engine Call of Duty was running on for years was a huge pain point for the Call of Duty franchise as well. And, you know, we heard it every year, every dev team say they made huge leaps in technology, brand new engine, you had fish. With the extended dev time, Infinity War truly created a new engine for this game. This isn't PR stuff, this is a genuine progression forward when it came to the engine and the technical abilities of Call of Duty. For the first time in a long time, Call of Duty was one of the most visually impressive games on the market. From a narrative and gameplay perspective, I was concerned that Modern Warfare 2018's campaign would try to just copy the key beats from Call of Duty 4. Scenes like the nuke going off, the AC-130 scene, all gillied up 2.0. Infinity War could just play it safe and just give us something that we already know that we like from COD 4. Though this interview with the developers really eased my concerns of no greatest hits. When we started making the game, we said to ourselves, no greatest hits. We want to do something where everything feels new. Right. We want to make you feel like when you were playing Modern Warfare for the first time. Not gonna lie, I was still worried that the name Modern Warfare was just being used to play off in nostalgia and to focus on their live service multiplayer model. As Infinity Ward games really struggled with their narratives after Modern Warfare 3, which is kind of interesting because Call of Duty came from an era where the campaign was the biggest selling point for shooters back in the day. And just kind of kept getting this feeling that the campaign was always just kind of like, yeah, we'll just throw something together, 
but focus on the multiplayer because we can keep making money off of that. We all know Activision cares way more about the bottom line on their stakeholders than they do artistic expression. As for myself, I quit playing Call of Duty annually after Black Ops 2. I skipped Ghost. I tried Advanced Warfare and it kind of just sucked. I skipped Black Ops 3. I skipped Infinite Warfare. I tried to like World War 2, but the campaign was just so mid and Black Ops 4 should have just didn't have a campaign. So with Infinity Ward bringing out the heavy hitters of Modern Warfare, bringing back Captain Price, Gaz, and a new slate of characters, it made me quite thirsty for a good Modern Warfare game in the Call of Duty franchise. So now with the scene set, there isn't much else to do but jump in and play the game. And so... I waited. Due to Modern Warfare's campaign being tied to the live service multiplayer, there were a lot of updates I had to run through, and I mean a lot. Previous Call of Duty games on Steam, you were able to download just the campaign, or just the multiplayer, or even just zombies. With Battle.net, it's all or nothing. So if Warzone gets an update that's multiple gigabytes in size, well, so does the campaign as well. Maybe with Modern Warfare 2 being on Steam, we could have that same quality of life upgrade, but honestly, I doubt it. So I finally sat through the update. I finally got to jump in to play the campaign again and remember, is it really as good as I remember? And when I finally had a chance to play, the audio was desynced. We are Al Qatala. What? We are the. Colonel, we may have a problem. Too late, Laswell. We're live. Not until I say so. First, the audio did not line up properly, so now I have to freaking do it all over again. This is great. And so I had to back out, boot up again, and just saying, it just kind of soured the mood a little bit. I just kind of pulled my hype a bit for playing the campaign. So the updates are done. We reset our game. Walk with me now as we take this beautiful journey through Modern Warfare 2019's campaign. The first thing you see in the game is a video recording of the wolf and the butcher providing the motives of the villains of the game. It's actually just saying that they will stop at nothing to achieve what they want. Honestly, kind of standard villain stuff. But then the camera pans over to a man strapped with a bomb and walks right onto the street full of civilians and just cuts right there with the tile saying Modern Warfare. I just want to say it's a nice touch because not very often do you get a chance to live out a scene through the perspective of the enemy. The franchise has generally kept you in the perspective of who you're playing as at the time. So that detachment from the player character and being thrown into a lethal situation with civilians gives you a feeling of what things might be like from that perspective of those terrorists. Involving civilians just instantly gives you that no Russian feel, which the devs said no greatest hits, but I see what you did there. But now we're finally into the gameplay, guys. Mission one, Fog of War. The first mission of any game is crucial to set the tone and help bring players into the world that the team has developed. Every movie has a hook, if you will. It's the first 15 minutes it's made to set up the world, the characters, and motives. Mission one, Fog of War, absolutely nails the hook of the game. First, you're wowed by the environment, the level of detail, the character models, the lighting, it's all fantastic. How the shadows are actually dark, not just shades of blue. These deep black shadows will certainly play a factor within the mission as well, helping create the tone and world of modern warfare. Plus, it's cool to have the same environment from the trailer to start out the game with. Bravo 6, going dark. So as you creep up to the base, you confirm there are no Russian military at the base, and so you make it rain with some eye candy. Oh my god. Yeah, dude. <laughs> it's a beautiful sight. But you feel like a badass with the power of the American military kicking ass kind of stuff. But when you walk up to the base, a man on fire walks out and falls to their death. This little detail absolutely hits me with the feeling that your actions have repercussions. Even though these people are the enemy, they're still people. Call of Duty and media in general really try to disassociate humanity from the enemy. That's why you see stormtroopers always wearing helmets and all disposable henchmen wear masks. Though you never make out the identity of the fallen soldier right there, I still just can't help but feel a little bit of sympathy for them. But it's time to forget your feelings because we're under attack! After slaying your way through this section, you're hit with a new Call of Duty mechanic 
that I foreshadowed in this video, True Darkness. After going through a typical Call of Duty battle, you kill the power and you're thrown into a slow, intense, pitch black encounter, which will set the tone in a future mission as well. But you still make your way through, you find the gash, you head out victorious, psych! You're ambushed by insurgents and they steal the gas, they recognize you as an American, so they get the hell out of there, which this interaction will be very important for later in the game. So with everything messed up, military forces are advancing, chemical weapons are in the wild. Who are you gonna call? Ghostbusters? Hell no, we need the big guns. Oh yeah, my boy's back in the game! Somehow, Price knows about the chemical weapons going to London, but I'll just roll with it because it moves the story forward. Now, a bit of a side rant when it comes to Captain Price because they didn't actually bring Bill Murray, the original voice actor for Captain Price with this game. They got a whole new actor. Now, he does do a fantastic job, don't get me wrong. But I think the reason why they didn't bring back the original voice actor, the techniques they used for the facial animations, they used the actual actor's face to actually animate along with that. But I do feel like Barry Sloan does a fantastic job of filling in Bill Murray's shoes. Honestly, I didn't even notice it until people brought it up online that it was a different voice actor. So Infinity Ward actually did a very interesting thing about Modern Warfare 2019's campaign is that you had voice acted playable characters. Now, this has happened previously in Call of Duty, but most of the time it was like one little liners here and there. You don't really feel like you are playing as a character. You feel like you're playing yourself in the role. In Modern for 2019, you really feel like you're playing as Gaz or Kyle in a way kind of thing. Because normally you play as a relatively silent protagonist. So with the mission of Piccadilly, you play as Kyle Garrick, AKA Gaz, the master teacher of watermelon slicing. Knife the watermelon. Nice! Mission accomplished! Good work, Marines! This campaign felt like it always had like a continual theme of vulnerability, where no one is safe, even civilians, and that's on full display on Piccadilly. To me, this mission felt like Modern for 2019's version of the No Russian mission. Instead of killing civilians, you're killing the bad guys, but civilians are certainly dying within the process. They shock value with civilians dying, caught up in the crossfire, Though with Piccadilly, the shock value didn't feel as gratuitous as No Russian. Though you're not walking through like you're some invincible monster, you're on the back foot fighting. Seeing civilians being murdered left and right, you feel this sense of hopelessness, but you're really trying your best. But this feeling hits the hardest when you try to save a man who has a bomb strapped to his vest. You can hear the panic in his voice, the fear in his eyes. Normally in Call of Duty, you end up being the savior of the day. You make it out with all your friends for the most part. Yeah, there are some he changes here and there, but not this time. The guy gets thrown over the railing and yeah. That one had to hurt. This honestly gave me like a sense of failure. Even though you did everything right according to the game, it just wasn't quite enough. And Gaz's dialogue in the cutscene, voicing his frustrations in not being able to save these people perfectly sets up the key character development later in the story as well. Next, we have the introduction of one of the new badass characters, Farah. You can tell that with her dialogue, she doesn't put up with people's BS. And I particularly like this one line from her. Before they, Before they what? Take it to Europe or America. We live like this every day. It really turns the conversation between Alex and Farah because she recognizes that Alex is only there to help because of Western interests. Farah knows there would be no help otherwise. The mission Embedded really lives up to Farah's dialogue too of showing, not telling. Now Embedded actually is a rather standard Call of Duty stealth mission, but what makes this mission stand out from all the previous stealth missions is that it does a great job of world and character building, showcasing how people are living in the area to help understand why people are rebelling against the current occupation. Farah also flexes some awesome combat skills, but this mission shows why Farah is a leader for her people because she is an amazing fighter, and as you follow her, she directs you to defeat the enemies in the mission. I also really enjoyed how the level design gave you multiple options on how to take out encounters. Most of the time you come across a hallway with some bad guys saying at the end of it, you just shoot them, but you could also do that, or you can sneak around the corner, get a nice little angle and take them out in a really stealthy way. 
just more player options with the gameplay, which I really enjoy. There was one section that I couldn't help but feel like it was an all gillied up reference. We have to lay prone in the grass surrounded by dead bodies, which is pretty graphic right there by itself. The subtle sound of your heartbeat playing in the background of the audio just increases that tension even more. Though, of course, not nearly as cool, but certainly captured the feels. This next mission though was probably the lowest point for me when playing this game and that was the mission Proxy War. It just it was just so disappointing. Not that it's bad or anything, it just stands out because it's the most standard Call of Duty mission in the game. You're given these little like toy drones with explosives on them and you which you can call in at any moment in the mission. To me, this just lessens the gravity of the mission using these little toy drones to blow up helicopters, which these helicopters have straight up stormtrooper aim, which is kind of hilarious. You just fly straight and try and go boom. As you make your way through the shooting gallery of not the smartest AI, you find yourself pinned down in the hangar. You're like, oh gosh, we're dead for sure. But don't worry, a surprise chopper gunner comes in and just blows everything up. And then when you're in that chopper gun, there's like no pushback, basically. You're just shooting fish in a barrel. And it's just like, man, it just like doesn't really feel that engaging or interesting, honestly. With everything feeling so grounded in the theme of vulnerability that was heavily emphasized, Proxy War just fell over the top and just kind of felt like another Call of Duty mission, ultimately just kind of out of place with the game overall. So we go from a low point in the campaign to one of the greatest missions of all time in Call of Duty history, in my opinion at least. This is Infinity War's most technically impressive mission of all time. When anyone talks about Modern Warfare 2019's campaign, the first thing anyone will say to you is how amazing the mission Clean House is. Now, a quiet, stealthy mission is nothing new to Call of Duty, so why does this mission stand out? The reason? Well, to simply put it, the gameplay and the immersion. While the mission is rather linear, the player is given total control the entire section. Choice of when to push up, how to breach doors, who to shoot, good or bad even. I love how if you make a mistake that the mission continues. Oftentimes in video games when you shoot or kill someone that you're not supposed to shoot, it reverts you to the last checkpoint. In Clean House, you have to live with your decisions. This one mission has more custom animations than the entirety of the original Modern Warfare and maybe even Modern Warfare 2. Infinity Ward went through multiple drafts of this mission before landing on the one that got into the game. Call of Duty normally has military consultants with their creation process to give you a sense of reality, right? But ultimately, the developers have to gamify it to make a fun video game. Though, even Navy SEALs were blown away by the accurate depiction in this game. Yeah, actually, they, they played the final game, I think like a week before it came out. One of them got on the phone and basically told us that this was the best representation of military action in a video game ever. And then they showed it to a bunch of their friends who were also ex-SEAL team members and those guys also got on the phone and basically said, this is incredible. This is the best it's ever been. Holy crap, I can't believe you guys did it. Big shout out to GameBrain having an excellent interview with the developers in this video. It's 100% worth listening if you have the time. This mission is a perfect example of what an extra year of development does for the final product. No way would Infinity Ward or any other studio be able to pull this off in their standard two year cycle. With half of the original level cut and only being a fraction of the total playtime, Clean House left a profound mark on not only Modern for 2019's campaign, but the franchise as a whole. So next we gotta talk about Hunting Party. Now the first half of this mission does feel rather run of the mill for Call of Duty. Shooting baddies, progressing through a level. This mission had some straight up Call of Duty 4 shock and awe feels, which fantastic. Even the color palettes used are very similar. But the second half, very different. It showcased the true scale level design they chose for the campaign having claustrophobic corners with civilians mixed in, trying not to hurt anyone who's innocent. This mission introduced the trip wires as well, but honestly, they didn't really do much for the gameplay. If anything, they just kind of slowed you down as the wires are very easily visible. Never did the trip wires really provide any player choice. What I mean by that is that you could give the player choice to take out a trip wire, but it might leave you exposed for a long period of time, or it could unlock easier pathways in the mission. 
Instead, it's more of an annoying little task you have to do to get an extra grenade. But you work your way through, you capture the wolf, all mission accomplished. Now this next mission has some pretty interesting historical ties as well. The Embassy, which is basically playing out the events of Benghazi. If you guys don't know, the events of Benghazi happened in Libya back in 2012, where it was a planned attack on the US Embassy where you had an ambassador, as well as a diplomat and two former Navy SEALs who died in the events. If you're familiar with American politics, it was a massive intelligence failure, with most of the blame being put on the future presidential candidate of Hillary Clinton. With the events happening just months before a presidential election for Obama, the team really tried to downplay what happened, blaming the violence was sparked by an anti-Muslim video, which wasn't exactly the case. Uh, requests to beef up security were denied, and the reason why it fell on Clinton is because she had the authority to raise the security, but it just didn't happen. This was a massive hit to Clinton's reputation, and I feel like it ultimately actually played part in her losing the presidential election of 2016. So, in short, Benghazi was a big freaking deal. Now you bagged the wolf, so it's time to get some answers. But plot twist, he actually doesn't have the answers that you're looking for. Though, the excellent editing of this scene starts to build suspicion around Hadir. We know that Alex and Farah have nothing to do with the gas, though as soon as the question of who has it pops up and Hadir walks into frame. We did not steal the gas. Who did? Someone very dangerous. Where is it? I wish I knew. The butcher is outside. Now at first playthrough you think, oh, he's just coming into the room and to provide some information to the heroes. Really though, the timing is to lay down a subtle line of suspicion with Hadir with his entrance into the scene right as the question is being proposed. We see this used in filmmaking all the time. But all hell's breaking loose, you crash land on top of the embassy and also thank God Price didn't lose his hat. But you make your way through the building and the player is given the choice to let Alcatala in. The reason why I kind of use the word choice with quotes is because you don't really get one. If you let Alcatala in, they kill you, mission restarts. And if you don't let them in, well, the family, well, kind of gets the short end of the stick there. This will be a bit of a reoccurring theme throughout the entirety of Modern for 2019's campaign that I will talk about when the time comes. So after some close course fighting and the most brutal takedown by Captain Price. <laughs> Oh, Price. Oh, brutal, but an absolute legend. You meet back up with the team, which then leads to a crazy intense section of leading the ambassador's assistant to the garage to use the key card to get the hell out of the embassy. So I won't lie, when I was playing, there were a couple bumps in the road. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, damn it. So you make your way out of the embassy towards the safe house, but then you get attacked again, which happened just like in Benghazi. This annex fight scene, one, does a great job to kind of create a little pacing right there, kind of slow down things and then kind of build up the tension back up. We have to hold your position and fight waves of enemies, which there's nothing new to Call of Duty, but normally you set it up a turret, kind of hold the fire down, kill a bunch of enemies. This section of the mission takes advantage of the new lighting in Modern for 2019, where the enemy would logically use the cover of darkness to approach your position. You literally can't see the enemy, it's so dark, which is amazing. To help out, you have some flares you have to use to your advantage to expose their positions, creating a terrifying situation of being outnumbered and the baddies are slowly creeping up closer and closer to you. Oh, that dude, that is just so terrifying, just seeing like an entire wall of people coming at you like that. You just couldn't see them at all. That's so crazy. Again, hitting that theme of vulnerability that the previous Call of Duties rarely give you a feeling of. One part that felt very Call of Duty-like to me was the whole laser targeter situation. Just one tapping everything in your way, and it's just not that exciting, really. Though, it's actually not too far from what can actually be possible. The ones we used, because we had something similar to this, uh, but it wasn't visible laser, it was IR, and it would be like a giant lightsaber that went for miles. And you could actually mark targets with that and call for fire on there, or mark targets for gun runs, or just calling in a bird, you can lasso them in and be like, hey, actually land here, because we need you. The only experience I had with the IR stuff is trying to find a house in a neighborhood you've never been in before. You have a surveillance bird. They could sparkle the house with yeah. this IR, and you couldn't see it to the naked eye, but you could see the house is lit up like a Christmas tree. Yeah. Now this was certainly twisted to be more friendly for the video game action. It actually is based in reality. 
So you clear out the area, you head back on to the get the wolf, and well, he's gone. So I came back to play a little more Call of Duty. That was about one play session. Came back in and uh, more load screens because you have to wait for the game to update because of Warzone getting their updates in there. So it's a great time to practice some bass guitar. Mission number eight, Highway of Death. Such a badass name, by the way. But this mission, while not inspired by the actual Highway of Death, and probably for good reasons that we'll get into a little bit later, Infinity Ward used this actual Highway of Death based on the February 25th through 27th, 1991 events where the U.S. Air Force bombarded the Iraqi army leaving Kuwait. The one line from Farah saying that the Russians bombed the road while al Qatala was fleeing it kind of hits a bit hard. The Highway of Death. The Russians bombed it during the invasion, killing the people trying to escape. There is a village at the crossroads. Yeah, the Russians. Khabir and his fighters there to prepare an ambush. Right. Alex and I will join them and take up firing positions above. The Highway of Death was the turning point of Operation Desert Storm to a resolution. Now, depending where you get your news from, either the American military stopped in advancing troops or killed thousands of fleeing military and people leaving Kuwait. The American Air Force bombed the front and the back of the caravan, blocking the road, and then everyone's pretty much just trapped right in there and proceeded just to continually do runs over the trapped vehicles until there was nothing left. A day later, the U.S. military ended Operation Desert Storm. So could that line from Farah be a little bit of social commentary from Infinity Ward about the actual events of the Highway of Death? I'll leave that to your interpretation. Though the sniping on this mission was pretty cool and felt like a bit of a shooting gallery though with no urgency until the mortar team started coming in. But I'm sure that shooting gallery and sniping section was more to kind of acclimate the players when it comes to lead time in the game for the mission. But it just felt like the snipes didn't really matter until those armored trucks came in. The level itself I found rather frustrating as you have Farah giving you commands to hold positions while you're overwhelmed by AI enemies. Seriously, I felt like if I peeked my head up for like a second, I'd just be instantly annihilated. Can't. Games is gonna kill me for peeking my head up and trying to fight. I hate this, oh my God. Fuck this game, oh my God. I'm just gonna die before I even have a chance to get to the freaking truck of the air. Sorry, can't do anything. Sorry, the game's just gonna kill me. It's like Halo 2 on Legendary instead of it's actually just hard in difficulty, which is ridiculous. Then Adir reveals that he stole the gas in the beginning of the game, which puts a whole new context on the previous scene. Because when Hadir meets Alex, you see him hesitate, like, what the hell's going on here? At first, you just think it's a reaction due to Alex being an American and Hadir wondering why would a person like that be involved in their plans. Possibly Hadir recognized Alex? Though I kind of doubt that as everyone was wearing a gas mask, though I like to think he did. Mission 9 Hometown does a really cool job of doing more world building and character building as well. As you play as young Farah trying to survive an attack from the Russians. This entire mission does a great job of playing into the line Farah said earlier that we live like this every day. Normally a line like that just kind of gets said and you're like, okay, yeah, whatever. But then you actually see what living in this area is like. Very well done. I don't know about you guys, but I was getting like major Outlast vibes from this mission. It's like a legit horror film because having to hide around the house from an overwhelmingly jacked Russian dude trying to kill you with lethal gas surrounding the house and your job is to survive. That's some straight up horror shiz right there. Dude in the room that wants to kill you. Surrounded, if you, but if you go outside, you're dead. Like what the hell? Toward the end where you're stabbing the soldier over and over as a child is just really shocking to me, honestly. Most people will point to Clean House as a standout mission, which it is for sure. Though Hometown really stands out for completely other reasons. I really can't recall any Call of Duty mission playing like this one. And again, leaning into that vulnerability of the player when Call of Duty normally tries to make you feel like an overwhelmingly badass strong man who has played off of power fantasies. This next mission is really cool because it's essentially the movie Zero Dark Thirty, where they captured and killed Osama Bin Laden. The mission Wolf's Den even kind of plays out how the tactics happened as well, where just like the raid on Bin Laden's house, you landed with two helicopters surrounding the compound. The mission starts out kind of retreading Clean House, which they put a lot of tech and custom animations in that one mission. So you know they had to kind of reuse that a little bit right there. 
Luckily, this section is shortened, so it doesn't really feel like you're completely copy pasta retreading the same kind of feelings. The second half, you go through a complex tunnel system, which plays off of the early 2000s news. We'd hear about Al Qaeda tunnel systems in Tora Bora. Now, me being a Call of Duty boomer, I can actually provide some funny insights to this back in 2001 when the War of Terror really started. Because when I was doing the research on this, I actually found an old image I definitely remember seeing on the news showcasing like this crazy like multi-level complex like tunnel system that's built right into the mountains like it's some kind of like hq that's like super complex and like high tech kind of stuff but in reality when i was doing the research it was actually just like a series of holes dug into the mountains that was like the tunnel system but going through these tense close quarter moments and dodging any traps kept you on your toes while you're going through the wolf's den it, oftentimes i found myself listening for enemy footsteps shuffle or voices around the corner it really put me on edge and created this atmosphere <laughs> There he is. Now after Hometown and the first two thirds of the Wolf's Den, it's about time to let loose. All chaos breaks out, everything gets put on fire, and ultimately you find the wolf, you kill him, and you have a classic movie sequence of cutting wires to defuse a bomb. But just make sure you time it properly. Cut the wire exactly when I say, not before. Ready. Green wire. In three, shit. Stop. I got a little excited. I know you said when. I know you said when. But I got a little nervous, okay? I'm not used to these 10 situations. 20 seconds. And know which wire is the top wire. There are two reds. The top one. In two, one. Now. Shit. How? Shit. Now. Cut. Okay, it was the top. top. That That's the right? bottom red. That was middle red. Good There's job. top red. There's three reds. So you save the day, you go back to headquarters, and then you're informed that Farah's troops are labeled as terrorists because of Hadir's chemical weapon usage. I found this so odd as we have first-hand knowledge from Kyle that Hadir went rogue and used the gas. You have all of the task force and Farah herself able to explain the entire situation. I feel like there was a clear and easy explanation that could help avoid Farah and her troops being put on the terrorist list. You have people directly involved. Just ask. Alex also going AWOL and joining Farah with the US military just letting him go. I feel like the military would just be like, The fuck you are. But I guess it helps out later with Price talks to Farah about attacking Barakov's base. Uh, but it just feels like it's just like an odd twist that ultimately didn't really affect the game at all as it was played. The 11th mission in this campaign, Captive, really kind of felt like a side quest kind of mission does provide more context of who Barkov is, as well as the prior relationship with Farah and Price. Oddly enough, it's not until we're like two thirds through the campaign, do we actually know who Barkov is, who is the main villain of this story. I feel like his addition into the story was so late, Barkov really just kind of came off as like an evil person who just wants power. Not that interesting, honestly. I mean, Halo Infinite's campaign did something very similar, right? where you only interact with the main villain until the very end, but at least Eshram is featured throughout the campaign to make him feel like he's integral to the story. Also, is it just me or does Barkov's voice sound really weird? Lying for him again, cost you. It sounds oddly band limited, almost like his voice is coming through like a radio or something like that. And maybe cutting out all the bass and mids from his voice gives us intense stage whispery voice action actors like to do. Trails, Hans. Now remember how I said earlier in the campaign we had like this false sense of choice? Well it kind of comes back around again with this mission. During the interrogation scene, you're given choices to navigate the story, but it really doesn't do anything besides give the illusion that the player has choice. Who is Karim? Eat shit, you fucking dog. I gave you a chance to save a life. Now let me show you how to take one. Don't she is out of my I gave you a chance to save a life. Now let me show you how to take one. Don't. There is no Kareem. I gave you a chance to save a life. Now let me show you how to take one. Don't she is out of my Bridget. See what you made me do. 
The messages are from me. I am Karim. I am responsible. <laughs> of course you are. Farah, no. I knew all along. Увидите. Tell the others, their fearless leader has broken. Obviously, one choice does save Azadeh, so there is a little bit of that, but it doesn't really play a factor in the next scene as Barkov knows your cream the whole time. Again, just kind of being just like an evil asshole. Plus, Barkov just wastes perfectly good food. You think this is a game? Dude, you're a dick. Huh? Ultimately, with this mission, you break out of your cell, you'll find a weapon, release your friends to go straight into some Call of Duty gameplay. That's pretty standard stuff. Interesting to me, at least, is that your friends will die in gunfights. I guess it's just that I'm so used to NPCs in battle being invincible, and they're really there just kind of distract the enemy AI, so not everything is focused on you. Oh man, your friends are even dying in this game? I thought it was just kind of like, you can kind of just roam around however you want. They'll be like invincible bullet sponges, but no, they actually die. But seeing your friendly NPCs die, one gives you a sense of reality, like, oh, there actually are things at stake right here, and a sense of urgency, and also a third thing about regret of not being able to save them. And right before you feel like you're gonna get clapped, the crew comes in and saves the day, and you get a nice appearance from young Price himself. Mission 12, old comrades start you out with Price walking down some stairs, you do have to dodge some oddly ghost-faced people. Hey, what's up with that guy's so face? Enough. That was kind of freaky. You get to choose a science pistol that you want. Ultimately, the choice doesn't matter. Seems like to be a little bit of a theme here, honestly. The whole first half feels like it's ripped out of those classic on-foot chase scenes you've seen in all those action movies. Ending with Nikolai bashing a butcher with his truck leading to a hilariously typical turret section where you're just shooting mindless enemies running out into the open with no concern or cover or anything like that. I talked about this in my previous Modern Warfare 2 video. Now the Infinity War devs are flexing their AI saying that it's more willing to preserve their lives. If you react in a certain way or if you move in a certain way the AI will react to you in a different way. What do people do in real life when they face this situation? We work with Navy SEALs just to make sure that everything that we do is as realistic as possible. In previous games, the AI felt like they were not appreciating their life, but in the new game, it feels like they are. AI is a huge part of this project. It is across the entire game where we put a lot of investment I think people are going to really, really enjoy it. So we'll just have to wait and see, but you know, I will be covering Modern Warfare 2's campaign on this channel, so make sure you subscribe for those videos. To end the mission off, we have a very intense interrogation scene with the Butcher, and you're given choices, yet again, all of them irrelevant to the most part of the events of this game. He's going after Barkov. We're done with him, you take a minute. <laughs> Russia and the West can go to war. Guys, this is the correct yeah, theater. Go, you have what you want. Guys, this is the correct no. theater. Now, I know this isn't Mass Effect where your decisions matter, and I understand that. But if you're going to give the player a choice, have them mean something. Yeah, you kill the butcher, or you also couldn't. Either way, police catch him, and that's the end of the butcher story arc. Maybe a Modern Warfare 2 tie-in if you let the butcher live, that'd be kind of cool, but I really doubt that. To end the mission, there is an amazing sequence with Gaz and Price. What the hell are we doing here? What can end up a mess? With women and children. They were leverage. They were hostages. When you take the gloves off, you get blood on your hands, Kyle. That's how it works. Where do we draw the line, yes, sir? You draw the line wherever you need it, Sergeant. This dialogue really helps Gaz grow as a person to fully understand what it takes and to be careful what you ask for. And like I said, that might come off as a little bit of a cliche kind of action movie line, but I thought it was perfect. The next mission here is a really cool example of giving the player so much choice and urgency within the mission. The mission going dark is just it's just awesome. That's I can't really say another way. It's just great. You can choose which locations you want to go to. If you want to go stealthy, if you want to go guns a blazing, even shooting out the lights helps provide dynamic cover to move throughout the level. Plus, prices sniping fools helping you out the whole time. It's pretty badass. 
So many good examples of just like player choice on this mission. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you again, Bryce. I really felt like my choices mattered when it came to how the gameplay of the mission unfolds. Obviously, you still hit all the same story points, but there's multiple ways you could go about this mission and no one playthrough would be the same. Trying to stealthily pick off the guards one by one and moving in the shadows to avoid the alarms is just an awesome experience. Most of the time in Call of Duty, you have to play stealthy. And if you're captured in the mission at any point, it restarts, but not with going dark. I love the freedom that the game gives to the player on this one. It just breaks the mold and just makes it such a unique experience and why this campaign does so many great things about this. It feels like it keeps giving you choice when it comes to gameplay, but maybe when it comes to the story, not so much. But just like the Wolf's Den, you know, we got a little trigger happy, we got a little anxiety kicking in, we got like everything else on fire and all hell breaks loose. You slay your way out of the buildings, dodge some helicopter shots, and make your way to safety with a deer in the plans. And here comes mission 14, the grand finale into the furnace, guys. And if you've watched this far in the video, thank you so much. I hope I've earned your like so far. But now we're at the culmination of everything that's happened within this campaign. After chatting with Faro, we have the crew back for one last mission to take down Barkov, the asshole. <laughs> I don't know if anyone else got this feeling too with this mission, but for how under the table this intro cutscene kind of set up the mission, it certainly felt like it came packing with tanks and laser targeted missiles. Oh my god, that transition is so sick. While over the top, enemies running out into the open just to be shot and just kind of cannon fodder for the most part. It's still kind of fun as it indulges in some Call of Duty gameplay and the beginning of the mission really leans into this indulgence. I mean I even sniped out a helicopter pilot and you just see it spiraling down and it explodes and you're like that was crazy. Like yeah, the old COD stuff but it's still pretty fun. Oh, that's one way to do it. <laughs> oh, come on, explode. Give me the, give me the, there you go. All right, that's what I wanted. So you make your way into the building itself, and it's pretty standard Call of Duty gameplay right there for the most part. You do end up running into Nikolai, who hooks you up with some of the explosives to destroy the containers. More typical Call of Duty gameplay, but then... Oh, it's the Judah! Bitch. The juggernaut fight totally caught me off guard. He's like running right at me. This guy's insane. This guy's sprinting with like full armor set. Are you happy? Holy crap. This guy's an actual psycho. This guy is actually terrifying. Alright, we got him. Alright. He was able to just face tank so much damage. And I just remember playing the mission before, back when the game came out. But playing it again, I was like, oh my god, I totally forgot about this. With your low health and having to frantically run around these turbines, it was just actually kind of an intense fight. But after taking down the Juggy, Kyle and Farah find the detonator is busted. So Kyle decides to sacrifice himself for the mission, which is epic and noble, but was it really necessary? Just like 10 minutes ago, we had like laser targeted missiles for support. Don't you think you could have just called in something to shoot down the bunker or buster or something like that? Obviously the blow up with a missile option is far less dramatic. Plus it is a good send off for the character Alex, but when he came back for Warzone season three, it just kind of lost its gravity, but Whatever, I guess. Then you switch over the price and gas, you set the charges, but then Barkov the asshole escapes, but not before. Farah has one last word and stabs the hell out of him, dropping an Arnold Schwarzenegger quality one-liner. No, this is for my family. And you get to choose the one-liner. <laughs> And we're done. The final cutscene of this campaign was kind of interesting. Obviously, it's meant to set up the hype for Modern Warfare 2, right? I just thought it was kind of odd, like how Price and Laswell were just like talking so casually out in the open about super top secret information in like just a random cafe. I mean, it sets a better scene, but I don't know. It just doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to me, but whatever. You know, just saying it might break protocol or something. But this is the tease for Modern Warfare 2 bringing the crew back, and then boom. The credits. What are you calling this task force? One for one. Now, was it worth playing Modern for 2018's campaign all over again? 
Well, I say it's important to have a fresh take on the game's predecessor to understand choices that are made in a new game. Also, with the initial reviews, Honeymoon Phase is certainly playing a factor. Going back and playing Modern Warfare 2019 was a chance to really know if the campaign was that good. And honestly, I'd have to say yes. So many sequences break through the typical Call of Duty tropes with missions like Clean House, Hometown, and the Embassy, while also providing that expected Call of Duty campaign experience with Proxy War, Hunting Party, and Into the Furnace. Modern Warfare 2 has a lot to live up to with its campaign. With the band back together, new character Alejandro Vargas certainly looking pretty awesome, I have a feeling MW2's campaign is going to be an experience worth checking out, which I plan to do on this channel. So thank you all for watching, and now you all have a great day.